can you hear me? I hope you can because it's Trail Tales time. You're listening to episode number 14 of the podcast where I, Kyle O'Grady, a through hiker and peak bagger, chat with other like-minded hikers who share their experiences on the trail and their insight into all things hiking. This week's episode is all about the Pacific Crest Trail. It's my first PCT episode. I'm stoked. I chat with Russell Korfman, who completed the walk from Mexico to Canada this past summer. That is the summer of 2018. Now, I've never hiked on the PCT before, so I thought it would be fitting to have my first PCT guest kind of help me get up to speed on some of the general information about the trail. We talk about the permit system that through hikers are required to participate in. We talk about some of the odds and ends of hiking in the desert, which is something I have no experience doing. And of course, we get to a bunch of Russell's stories about his through hike and some of the other adventures in the backcountry that he has gone on. It was a great chat. Russell, when you hear this, thank you so much for coming on. I'm going to stop blabbing here in just a second. But first, I want to say a couple things to everybody listening. First of all, if you hearing this right now are planning on hiking the Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, or the Continental Divide Trail this upcoming summer, that is the summer of 2019. I guess it wouldn't be just the summer, but yeah, the year of 2019. I want to hear from you. I think it would be pretty cool to kind of set up a little system where I follow a couple people on their through hikes this year, and maybe share some updates at the beginning of every episode. I think that would be fun. We can kind of interact on Instagram a little bit, get something going there. I don't know. It just kind of popped into my head now, but I think it would be cool. If you're interested in doing something like that, definitely let me know. Now, you're probably wondering, Kyle, how can I let you know that I'm interested in this? Well, that is a great question, first of all. And second of all, you can do it a number of different ways. Now, this goes for anybody who wants to contact me, even if you are not doing a through hike this year. You can send me an email, trailtalespod at gmail.com, or you can go on Instagram, at trailtalespod. I'm on Twitter as well, at that same handle. If you have any suggestions for me about how I run the show, if you have any suggestions for guests or trails you'd like me to cover, definitely contact me. Also, if you'd like to be a guest on the show as well, if you've done some sort of thru-hike or cool hiking adventure that you want to talk about, definitely let me know that's right russell was actually a fan of the show who reached out to me talking about his pacific crest trail through hike and i was like you know what you should come on the show and share your experiences and i'd like to do that in the future with more people as well so yeah moral of the story contact me give me something to do i'm bored okay let's move on to reviews that's right i haven't gotten any reviews in the last couple weeks If you like what you hear and you want to help me out a little bit for some crazy reason, leave me a five-star review on iTunes. Please, please, please. I am begging you. I love the feedback. If you write a nice little message attached to it, I'll happily read it out loud at the beginning of the next episode. And it'll be all good and dandy. It'll be a lot of fun. So please leave me a review. I really, really appreciate it. It helps the show out a lot. And the other thing I want to say, the last thing before we get into this, is that I am considering making a Patreon for Trail Tales. Now, this is something that's been suggested to me by a couple fans, and I didn't really put too much thought into it until now. The show has kind of started to grow a little bit faster than it was when I first started. Still not very much, still very small, but I thought it would be fun to maybe make a Patreon and provide some real hardcore fans of the show, if I have any of those at all, with some bonus content, maybe do a couple bonus episodes a month or some YouTube videos or, I don't know, some sort of bonus content related to the show. If you think you would be interested in that, definitely let me know. The show will always be free. These main episodes will always be free, but I I just think it would be kind of fun to make some extra content and get to know some of my fans a little bit better. I don't know. Yeah. If you got a few bucks to spare and you're interested in that, Keep your eyes, actually I guess it would be your ears, keep your ears peeled over the next couple weeks because I might pull the trigger on Patreon and that will be lots of fun. Okay, that's enough talking. Well, I guess it's not enough talking because the whole episode is talking, but that's enough introduction, blabbing, 
let's get into the episode with Russell Korfman, PCT Class of 2018. Welcome to episode number 14 of Trail Tales. Today I am joined by Russell Korfman, my very first PCT guest on the show. I'm very, very excited about that. I guess my guest two episodes ago, uh, the hiking prodigy, he hiked the PCT, but he also hiked the AT and the CDT, so I'm not really going to count that in the same category. So Russell is our very first, you know, sole PCT hiker, and I'm very, very excited about that. Russell, how are we doing tonight? Doing great, Kyle. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, no problem, and I really appreciate you taking the time as well. So for those of you listening, this is going to be kind of a general episode about the PCT. I honestly just don't know that much about the PCT. I've never hiked on it. I've never even been to any of the states that the trail goes through in my entire life. I've only been to the West Coast couple times anyway. So honestly, most of today's episode is just going to be Russell kind of answering some of the questions that I've had for a while about the PCT and kind of factoring those questions into his experience uh, during his through hike as well. So I apologize to those of you that might know the answers to a lot of these questions, but you know, I got to learn somehow and why not get it on recording and make an episode out of it. So with that said, before we get into some of the more specific details about the PCT, Russell, as I'm sure you know, the way I like to start off all my episodes is just kind of gauging, you know, how my guest learned about long distance backpacking and how they got into it. So why don't you go ahead and talk a little bit about how you learned what long distance backpacking was and you know, what made you decide that you wanted to hike from one end of the country to the other end of the country, border to border on the PCT? Yeah, it's actually a fun story. I live in Arizona, so I would go and and hike in the Grand Canyon a bunch. And uh, I did a couple trips at the end of 2014, um, one in mid-October and another one in November. When I got back from the second one, I was talking to my wife and daughter, and they brought up, they kind of asked how come I never backpacked the Arizona Trail, and I just decided a week or two later that I would would hike the Arizona Trail. Just kind of on a whim like that, huh? Yeah, so it was a section, I section hiked it. I started the weekend before Thanksgiving in 2014, and then I completed the Arizona Trail, I think the following October. But on the way, I met a lot of long distance hikers. And um, so I never really thought of doing the Arizona Trail all in one swoop or any other long trail, really. But yeah, I I met several long distance hikers. I met even a guy named Crudmaster who had set the PCT fastest known time with Scott Williamson in 2009. And then I met uh, a lot of people know him as the real hiking Viking on Instagram and yep, stuff. He, yep. he hiked uh, the Arizona Trail before he went to hike the PCT that year. And uh, some other long distance hikers that had hiked the PCT and the AT and the CDT and stuff. So just talking to them, I found out about long distance hiking. And after my. Uh, section hiking of the AZT, I just started doing other trails, such as the Wonderland Trail around Mount Rainier and the Tahoe Rim Trail. Oh, okay, cool. And uh, the Colorado Trail, and then the PCT this past year. So kind of following up on that there, when did you kind of, I guess, get it in your mind that you wanted to do the entire PCT, if that makes sense? Because you said, you know, you kind of learned about long distance backpacking through them, but that doesn't mean you necessarily want to commit to, you know, hiking one of the big three in the PCT, obviously. So, like, how did you kind of come to the idea to do a through hike of the PCT specifically? I don't know. When I get involved with things, I tend to jump in the deep end a lot. And um, so I just started this hiking longer and longer, and it just seemed like 
something that appealed to me. Yeah, I don't know if there's a real time when I decided I wanted to do it or not. I know I was, wanted it to be the Pacific Crest Trail because I grew up in Washington State and I knew I wanted to go northbound because it'd be like I was heading to my childhood right, home. Right, kind of walking home in a sense. Yeah, yeah. No, that that makes sense. So why don't we kind of get into some of the actual details about the PCT. Now, one of the things that has always kind of made me curious about the PCT, or since I learned about it at least, is the permit system, right? So that's something that PCT prospective hikers have to kind of tackle before, you know, well before they even get to the trail and start their through hike. So why don't you kind of just talk a little bit about you know, how this permit system works. Cause I'm, like I said, I am not familiar with this at all. The AT, you know, you can kind of like register with the ATC, but it's not mandatory. And, um, so yeah, why don't you just kind of talk a little bit about the permit system and how your experience with that was. Okay. So if you're doing a long distance hike, which is going to be defined as 500 or more miles, you can get a PCT long distance hiking permit from the Pacific Crest Trail Association. And it's really just a convenience to have because you don't need to get a permit to go through along, say, the John Muir Trail through Yosemite or or Sequoia or Kings Canyon National Parks. Your PCTA permit will cover you there. So it's really a convenience so you don't have to get these other permits as you go through various other parks or, or whatever on the PCT. Okay, so yeah, I actually didn't see, I, I didn't know that. So that does make a little more sense. I guess on that note, so one of my questions I have written down here was, what would <laughs> what would happen if, you know, Joe Schmo decided to just show up in Southern California without a permit on, you know, whatever day he wanted, say, you know, the peak, whatever the most popular start date is, and he just decided to hike northbound, like what would happen? Not that I advise you do that at all, but I'm just kind of curious, yeah. honestly. So probably the most popular start date is April 20th. But like I said, they you can only get the permit if you're going to hike or if you're planning to hike 500 or more miles. So if you were only going to go, say, 300 miles, you wouldn't be able to get a, get a permit. Right. So then you could still start at the the southern terminus and and there's nothing stopping you um but for example there's places that you would need to get a permit like if a lot of people will stop at what's called hauser creek which is about 15 miles into the pct and there's a national forest i'm sorry i don't forget the, i forget the name of the forest but i think you need a permit to camp there overnight okay at hauser creek so you wouldn't be able to camp there unless you got a permit from the Forest Service. So likewise, if you didn't have a PCT permit, you could get a permit from the National Forest and, okay. and then camp there. So there's just other ways to get the permits. The way the PCT permit goes is for starting at the southern terminus or near the southern terminus, I think, I don't know if this is right, but I think it's, what they say anything within the first hundred miles or so okay you you get a permit and there's like a lottery to get the permit and they only allow 50 permits per day to be given and uh i think you put in to get the permit early november they open up 35 slots and then like mid january they open up the last 15 slots. So you can try to get a permit that way. If you don't have a permit, you can still start, but you can't camp anywhere where a permit's needed to so camp. So it's just a lot more inconvenient, I guess. Right. So that's kind of interesting because, to be honest, I kind of assumed, and again, this assumption was based off of almost no knowledge about the permit system, hence why I'm asking about it but just off the top of my head i guess i kind of always assumed that the permit system was there to kind of prevent overcrowding on the trail i guess because i mean that's kind of i feel like that's just kind of like intuitive like what 
you might think, but now that you say that, that makes a lot more sense because I did know that there was other spots on, you know, that kind of coincide with the PCT and spots that the PCT goes through that do require, you know, a permit like that. So I guess it makes a lot of sense now to know that the one PCT permit just covers all that stuff. So it's really in the hiker's best interest, I guess. So that makes a lot of sense. I'm kind of glad you explained that. Can you kind of talk a little bit about your experience in particular, you know, with the permit system? Like what day were you trying to get? And, you know, did you get like the day that you wanted from the start? Like how like did you have to like, I don't know, like were you on the computer like at midnight right when it opened to like try to, I don't know, like just what was your experience, you know, using uh, the online permit system like that, like trying to get your name in there? Yeah, it's it's a little different now uh, than it was when I did it. But um, I, I mean, I know they change it this year for 2019 hikers, but oh, okay. in 2018, basically they opened it up. I don't know what time, maybe 10 in the morning Pacific time. Okay. And uh, it was kind of a first come first served. And basically my daughter was planning on hiking with me. So we both got on our, our laptops and we got in there and, and she was able to get her permit before I did, but we chose to start May 4th and we both got that permit date. Um, so Star Wars Day, basically, <laughs> may the fourth be with you kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we got the permit date we wanted and and that worked out nice. Like you mentioned, the quota system was brought in to help protect the trail so they wouldn't have days where lots and lots oh, of people would Oh, so is the quota start. system new this year? No, it was started a few years ago. And it just just started, or the quota system is only for starting at the southern end of the trail. Oh, okay. So if you're planning on hiking Sobo, then you can just get the permit whenever. Right. It's not a not a problem. There's also a quota for how many they let go through the Sierra, but it's like a it's like just a number for all season kind of. Okay. It's it's not like a each day they only allow so many in. So right. Right. It's it's different. I'm not real familiar how that works. Yeah, no, that makes sense because uh, I know Baxter State Park on the Appalachian Trail does a similar thing. They have like a number of through hikers for the whole year that can kind of go up. I think I think it is a different number for each direction. I don't think it ever like is like filled. Like I don't think they ever are just gonna like not let somebody summit Katahdin because they pass that number because I think they kind of purposely set it high. I think I, I'm pretty sure about yeah. that. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to <laughs> hold myself to it. But I heard about that, and what I heard, which could easily be wrong, is that if once they reach that number, then you just have to go to the office yes. and get a permit, as opposed to just being able to go up. And yeah, I, it's something like guitar. that. I know they they still want you to go check in at the office, but um, I think maybe after that, instead of giving you a like through hiker permit they just would give you like a different kind of permit so yeah there don't worry people yeah. Baxter State Park is not going to not let you hike just because more people hike before you so yeah don't worry about that um <laughs> i guess back to the PCT no that i actually have a much better understanding of the permit system now um cuz like i said i thought it was just for trail conservation purposes and making sure you know things don't get too overcrowded but um I kind of understand that that's part of it now, but it also is just more convenient for everybody, you know, kind of issuing the permit so that people can get through the different sections of the trail where you would need a permit if you weren't through hiking. So that makes sense. So let's kind of move on to the next subject of Kyle's curiosity about the PCT. And that is resupplying and towns along the PCT. So I'm sure people that listen to the show have heard me talk a lot about this on the AT, and they probably remember that I've said that it's very, very easy to resupply on the Appalachian Trail, and it really is. You know, every three to four days, you can go into town. I mean, very rarely do you have a hard time getting a ride in, and if you do say you can't get a hitch in, there's usually a shuttle available that you can kind of arrange. Um, you know, just my point is... Resupply on the AT is very frequent and very easy. So I kind of want to know what it's like 
on the PCT. Now, I know you haven't done the AT, so don't feel like you have to compare it to that. But I guess to kind of start off here, how frequently, you know, on average, I know it varies, obviously, but how frequently would you say that you were uh, going into town to resupply? Like, and, and how many days, you know, between those resupplies usually? I think it was usually about four days. So not too much longer. I mean, there was some care, like going through the Sierra, um, it, there's not nearly as many places to resupply. So that was a bit longer. I think maybe six days may have been okay. my longest, but mostly four days probably for me. Um, I also starting out, it's it's pretty easy to get the swing of things just starting out because resupply is really easy, at least starting from the south. Okay. So, I mean, you go 20 miles and you get to Lake Morena and... There's uh that's like a state park, I think. And so a lot of people stop there and spend the night there. And there's a little burger milkshake shop, you know, so you can get dinner there. So it's right on the trail. Stuff. You don't even have to like hitchhike into a separate town. Yeah, it's right there. And then 40 out uh, like 41, 42 miles, you get to a little town called Mount Laguna and it's right off the trail too. And you can, they have a little store there, and and uh, you can like I got dinner there, so I didn't even need to pack dinners for the first two days, but I I did, so then my my resupply lasted pretty long. So yeah, it's usually starting out is pretty pretty easy. I think a lot of people fret about it a lot, but you get to a mile like about 109, and you get into this place called Warner Springs, which is a really small community. I mean, they have like a gas station and a golf club. And they're super, super hiker friendly. So they let all the hikers stay at their community center. And they have a way to get um, showered up, cleaned up, do your laundry. And they'll drive you in, in and out of town so you can go get a burger and get some food at the gas station. And they had they sell food at the hiker type food at the community center too so that's the first hundred miles and then then there's Idlewild is a, is a great town it's a really nice mountain town it's about 180 miles in a lot of people will zero there and, and stop and that's right below the first big climb which is San Jacinto oh and there's also um, Scissors Crossing which is 77 miles into the trail and that's uh it was like really hot when I went into Scissors Crossing. So you drop way down into the desert and there's a big, huge water cache. So the town supplies or maintains this water cache under this bridge. So mm -hmm. a lot of hikers will hang out under the bridge and just stay there in the afternoon and, and then hike out in the evening. And that's what I did. And I hitchhiked into this town, Julian, called Julian. So... From Scissors Crossing, you hitch up to Julian, and it's in the mountains, so it's cooler, and the community is, like, shuttling hikers back and forth, so the hitch mm -hmm. is really, really easy. Okay. And uh, there's a, this is another reason to have your pim permit, too, because there's a, a shop, Mom's Pies, I think it is, and they'll give you a free pie, a oh, piece of nice. pie, um, <laughs> if you show them your permit. I guess kind of... I know you just mentioned a second ago, you know, like hitchhiking. So again, relating this back to the AT from my end, generally speaking, there was only a couple times where I probably had to hitchhike more than say seven, eight, nine, ten miles. I mean, I know there was a couple times, I know Gatlinburg, Tennessee comes to mind that it was about 15 miles from the trailhead to, you know, the center of town. and I remember that was probably the longest hitch on the entire AT that I did, honestly. Now, from my slight understanding, though, there's some more towns on the PCT that are kind of further away to, you know, hitchhike to from the trail. Is that correct? Like, how, how far were you having to hitchhike off the trail usually to go into the towns that weren't, you know, right on the trail? I, I think probably 10 miles is pretty common. Some somewhere around there, so I think Julian was probably ten miles or so, maybe a little more, and okay. it's a big climb. 
but I mean that was that was like the easiest hitch ever. I mean I um the the trail goes along the road for a while and and I and then you cross the road and go to where this bridge is and this this guy pulled over and and he goes I'm, I'll take you up to Julian if that's where you want to go. I'm <laughs> heading there. And yeah, Southern California the hitching's really easy um cuz you're basically everybody's aware of what's going on. Right, I, I right. assume that's your same experience on the AT. Oh yeah. Through those trail towns. And the resupply is really easy in the Southern California too, because uh, there's just a lot more hikers and, and stuff. So, and there's more places to stop. I didn't send any boxes ahead until Northern California and Washington and Oregon. Okay, so that's actually kind of touching on another subject I was going to ask you about. On the AT, I would say that mail drops, you know, sending yourself food ahead of time is not necessary at all, pretty much. I mean, if you have some sort of dietary restrictions, you know, that's a different story. But, you know, someone with a normal, you know, shitty hiker diet, (laughs) you're not really going to have to do any, uh, like, bounce boxes or mail drops for food. Is the PCT like that as well? Can you do, you know, I guess, I'm sure you probably can, but do most people do the entire PCT without doing any mail drops uh, for food anyways, like is fairly common on the AT? Or are there any spots in particular on the PCT where, okay, you really have to send food here if you're going to resupply there? I think most do send boxes. I think most get the boxes on trail and send them on trail. I think doing it ahead of time at home and having somebody send them as you move along isn't a good idea because there's enough towns with good grocery stores and stuff along the way where where you'll know okay I'm going to need something at this town cuz there's just a grocery store or it, there's just nothing here but a post office so it's easy to get that figured out as you move up the trail right so so you'll go like okay I'm going into Ashland Oregon so I'm going to I'm going to stop here and, and create a box and ship it to the next spot or something. And so I did that a lot of times. And sometimes I just called my wife and said, hey, can you ship a box here? And um, she she went and put it together. So you were having to use mail drops like fairly frequently then, it sounds like. Was that out of necessity because there just wasn't any places to buy food in these towns? Or was that more just because, you know, that's what you preferred to do? I think there's, uh, yeah, about eight or nine where it's a good idea to send yourself a box. Okay, wow, well, that's, places. see, I I didn't really realize it was that, I guess there's that many towns where you had to, or resupply stops that you had to do that. Because like I said, on the AT, yeah. that's just not really a thing at all. <laughs> yeah, the first place I sent a box, myself a box, was to... Kennedy Meadows South, which is basically right where you enter the Sierra. Okay. So I, there's a town called Tehachapi, and um, it's about 135 miles before Kennedy Meadows South. So I went and stopped there, and I, I sent a box to Kennedy Meadows South. And then my wife actually sent a box there, too, with my bear can and, and uh the micro spikes and and a different backpack that I used through the Sierra, and and my trekking poles because I forgot them when when we drove out to California. So, oh jeez! <laughs> so she sent my trekking poles out too, and some other stuff. So I sent a box there, and then she also sent me a food box to Kennedy Meadows North, which is basically when you exit the Sierra. Okay. And there's there's like a little. Kennedy Meadows there is like a resort place and and so we went in there and spent the afternoon there got you know a restaurant and stuff and that was kind of a difficult hitch in and out it was okay but it it was kind of difficult there's tons of hikers there so it was a fun spot because everybody kind of groups there Mm -hmm. and that comes out that's from a place called Sonora Pass where you hitch from the trail to there and and there's also a guy that runs a, a resupply outfit at Sonora Pass. So he's got permits with uh, the Forest Service. And he'll sit right at 
Sonora Pass. He's got a truck, and you can sh- have him. He'll bring. A, you can ship a box to him. Oh wow! And he'll bring it out there, or you can order food, and he'll put it together, and he'll bring it out there, or he'll ship it to other places. Well, that's um, pretty cool. Yeah, and so I dropped my bear can off with him, and he mailed my bear can home. Because that was basically the last place you need it. Right, right. No, that's okay. That's that's interesting. I guess kind of while we're still on this subject of like towns resupplies. Now on the Appalachian Trail, the trail town culture. I guess that's what I wrote down in my notes. What I'm referencing there uh, is very pervasive throughout the entire trail. Right. So you've got towns, you know, like Damascus. And Hot Springs, just to name a couple off the top of my head, that are just very, the entire towns are just very tied in with the whole trail culture. And you're going to find hostels that cater to hikers. You're going to find businesses, obviously outfitters, but, you know, stores and stuff, kind of like you've talked about a little bit, that that cater to all the through hikers. And there's almost like a little mini economy that kind of revolves around the Appalachian Trail and the through hikers that are kind of coming in and out of these towns uh, throughout the parts of the year. So I guess what I'm kind of trying to ask here is, does the PCT have kind of a, I, I don't want to say similar culture because I know you haven't done the AT, but does the PCT have a trail town culture like that? Like, are there like frequent hostels along the trail? Does pretty much every trail town have like some sort of services for hikers, you know, whether it's, like I said, hostels or other businesses that kind of cater to the hikers like that? To some extent, I don't think it's nearly as pervasive as it would be on the AT, Um, especially in Southern California, because you're getting a lot of the, well, a lot of people start and then a lot of people stop after, you know, they've had enough or whatever, wasn't what they wanted or their feet hurt or something like that. But yeah, so I mentioned Warner Springs, and that's the whole community center is caters to the hikers. So, and they get volunteers to to shuttle you know the hikers back and forth into the community and stuff like that. And there's some other towns that are really hiker friendly in Southern California. I mean, Idlewild is, and Wrightwood is, and that's like mile 370, and then. There's a place called Hiker Town, which is a really funky place. That's its like official name is Hiker Town, or is that like a nickname? Yeah, it's basically just some people bought this property, and it has like these little teeny, like fake houses. They're like a room, but they're looks like a little western town. <laughs> um, it's it's really funky, and uh, the hikers stay there. I sent a pair of shoes there. And, and stuff that I got and you know that's kind of weird place there's some um, trail angels that everybody tends to go to and there's a town called Agua Dulce and there's a trail angel there the Softleys I think and uh, they have what's called hiker heaven so they just open their property up and all the hikers come there and uh it's it's a huge production. I mean, they ship boxes and receive boxes, and they have sewing machines so you can repair gear, and um, they have a place where you can shower, and they'll do your laundry, and that's a good place to just get things straightened out and take care of business. And then, like, 24 miles past that is another uh, Trail Angels called the Andersons, they have what's called Casa de Luna. And that's more of a good place just to rest and relax mm-hmm. and not take care of business, but just rela- rest and relax. I've heard of that place before. Yeah, they uh, they make a taco salad dinner every day for people and they cook you breakfast and everything. You know, these people are just absolutely wonderful. Mm. And they have other hikers, past hikers come in and they're helping them out and stuff. So those are are great stops, and and they're all about the trail. And Tehachapi is is another trail, um, and it's I got my cheat sheet with me. So when you go to <laughs> the Andersons at Casa de Luna, you basically dance for a 
PCT class bandana, and it it's um, basically sponsored by Yogi. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of her, but she's a triple crowner, I think a double triple crowner. And um, so they basically get these bandanas made up every year, and they got like all the trial towns or stops on it listed in their miles, so that's my cheat sheet. Oh, I have my nice. bandana in front of me right now. <laughs> So I kind of want to move on and talk a little bit about desert hiking. So I've said this a thousand times, but I'm going to say it again. Yeah, I am from Vermont. I have spent my entire life in Vermont and all of my hiking experience, except for a couple hikes in Glacier National Park uh, last summer, two summer 2017, whatever summers ago that was, um, I've pretty much only hiked on the East Coast. So I, I don't even think I've been in a desert before, let alone hiked in a desert. So honestly, you know, as somebody who has aspirations to do the PCT someday, that is something that I have a lot of questions about and honestly am kind of nervous about because, like I said, when I was in Glacier National Park, you know, long story short, I had a little bit of a situation at one point where I was kind of starting to come down with heat exhaustion you know i thankfully it worked out like i was fine but i was getting those initial symptoms you know i was nauseous i was extremely fatigued i was definitely dehydrated and i was really really sunburnt i didn't have any sunscreen with me like an idiot and you know that experience kind of has just made me a little bit more i don't want to say hesitant but a little just kind of nervous for the desert section of the PCT. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? So first of all, water obviously is a really big issue uh, when it comes to the desert. So I guess how big is the stretch on the PCT where water is kind of a real concern, I guess, you know, for your hike? Like how, how long are you going with these longer water carries? Yeah, it starts out with a worry about water i mean in your first day so for example um you start at the southern terminus and then there is some water within the first four miles like there was some standing water which i think most people wouldn't even want to look at especially somebody who'd done the at before yeah I looked at it and I'd done the AZT and I thought, oh, that looks actually looks fine to me. <laughs> um, it's all perspective, right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I didn't. I mean, that was pretty early on. But there was some running water uh, a couple miles later, so I stopped there and and uh, drank a bunch and made sure I had enough water to get to the rest of the way to the Lake Morena. A lot of people try to camp at at Hauser Creek I mentioned before it's yeah. like 15 miles in and there's probably not going to be any water there though I think you can walk a mile and find water or you can walk five miles up the hill and get to Lake Morena. Now how far north does the desert section go like how how many miles how long time wise do you have to be like concerned with uh, just having enough water, I guess. I mean, that's just, it, it starts out bang. You got to worry about water the first day. Right. Cause people aren't in shape and it can get hot, especially the last five miles from Hauser Creek. You got a, your first big climb up to Lake Morena. So, and a lot of people just don't know how much they need right, water wise right. yet. And they're not, hiking shape yet and stuff so it just makes things worse mm -hmm. or they don't realize they need to drink more than just water you need to eat stuff or drink gatorade or powerade or something like that you know so but but basically the desert is kind of all of southern california is kind of considered the desert okay. so i would say the first 700 miles wow all the way up to candy Jeez. meadows <laughs> so, and and actually, some of the driest, worst parts are from Tehachapi to Kennedy Meadows. And Tehachapi is looking at my cheat sheet here. <laughs> anyway, it's probably about it's probably about five hundred and seventy miles or something okay. like that. Yeah. So that whole first beginning, I guess, if you can even call 
being 700 miles in the beginning, but that first part of the trail sounds like it's pretty dry. Um, I'm sure it's awesome, California, Western Coast people, but that sounds rough. <laughs> well, it's it's you just need to pay attention. Right. I mean, it's right. not it's not a huge issue. You just need to pay attention. So, somebody keeps up a water report. Yes, I've heard about this. People will basically add comments to the water report and somebody will update it. So basically when you get into town, you go get the latest version of the water mm -hmm. report for the section you're going into and it'll give you a good idea of where there's still water or where there isn't water. And uh, so you'll adjust things accordingly. And also most people were using the, the uh, gut hook gut app. Hook, yeah. Yeah. And so everybody, hikers are leaving comments on where there is water and stuff like that. So, Basically, it's not needed so much for navigation, but just for the comments on how the water's doing. Okay. So you just got to pay more attention. It's like, okay, I don't have water for the next 10 miles. I better get enough, and I'm going to stop mm -hmm. overnight in between. So there's a lot of dry camping. I, I mean, I rarely camp by water. And I, I personally, I'd rather dry camp just because by water you get more bugs and you get more dew and stuff like that yeah yeah you just need to pay more attention to things and you're going to be carrying more than a couple liters of water a lot of times yeah so that kind of relating to that another question i was going to ask is how long was like your average water carry and then how long was like the longest water or yeah the longest water carry you had and then how much did you have to carry there so I think 10 miles is pretty common um, between water, which isn't all that bad. But there was some long, I mean, there was a lot of 20-mile sections, and yep. there was a 40-mile section Ooh. near, I mean, that was between Tehachapi and Kennedy Meadows. So it was probably, it was going in towards Walker Pass, uh, which is... <laughs> Consult the cheat sheet. Yeah, yeah, which is mile 652. Gotcha. So, yeah, between, the stretch from Tehachapi to Kenny Meadow South was probably where you'd have the driest sections. But there's there are some water caches that you can absolutely depend on. Okay, People say not to, but there's some, yeah, absolutely can, and they expect you to. So there's like the third gate. I think it's called the Third Gate Water Cache, which I think I got to my third day. And uh, and that you can pretty much guarantee it's going to be there. And there's some others that are like that. The one at Scissors Crossing, you know, the town maintains, there's, there's water there. Okay. And there was a couple. So like going into that 40-mile waterless stretch, there was actually two water caches through it. So it wasn't so bad. Um, we heard it at the where there there was a spring, so a really good spring. So I sat around there for a while, and a guy came, and we got trail magic and stuff. It was great. Mm. Um, he brought uh, chips, a banana, Mountain Dew, toilet paper, hand cleaner, and stuff. It was really super. <laughs> you remember it all? <laughs> yeah, all it details. was really nice. Oh, and I think I think some Oreo cookies too. So. Yeah, see, those things tend to stick in your head like that. So yeah, I think the guy's name was Siri. <laughs> he had hiked a lot of the trail before. I think his trail name was Siri. Shout out to Siri and his trail magic. Yeah, um, for sure. Kind of going back to the desert thing a little bit. So I guess just what other advice would you give someone like me who is born and raised? in an area where there's like too much water most of the time and rather than the opposite which it sounds like is the problem uh in california so what yeah so what what like general advice would you give to somebody who's like me never hiked in the desert before and all of a sudden is in the desert trying to do the pct what other desert hiking general advice would you give as far as you know not just necessarily water but you know i don't know sun or heat any of that stuff so I like using an umbrella because you can usually not need to carry so much water. So I think that offsets the weight of the umbrella. Um, a lot of people don't like them. 
I carry them in my hand. A lot of people try to connect them to their packs, mm-hmm. but I carry it in my hand. So you didn't? Did you have trekking poles too? Not in. Oh, that's that right. Part. You. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We talked about that. But <laughs> even even if I did, I would just. I would only use one pole okay. if I was doing the umbrella. Um, they get blown around. Southern California is real windy, so umbrellas don't work a lot of the time. Um, but that helps. Like I said before, you just really need to pay attention to where the next water is. And basically, when you get to where there is water, drink up, yeah. camel up, as we say cowboy camp as often as you can because it's just nice and uh enjoy it i don't worry about finding water where i'm going to sleep i make sure i have water to get to the next source and if that includes an overnight then i'll plan accordingly so so i would leave in the evening a water source a lot of times with like four liters or something like that Mm -hmm. or three and a half Three and a half to three and three fourths was my normal. But I lucked out this year. The PCT it was actually really mild. Um, there was like a heat wave when I started, and then after the first week, it cooled down and was actually pretty reasonably nice. It was not like that on the AT, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> yeah. It was hot this year. You guys had so much rain. I'm like a fair weather hiker. I don't think I could handle that. <laughs> hey, don't knock until you try it. Yeah, we uh we did have quite a bit of rain though. What was it? Uh, the hiking prodigy, my guest two episodes ago, was telling me that people at the ATC told him that this past year was the wettest year on record that they had seen, which is pretty crazy. I did not realize that when I was out there, and it kind of makes me feel a little bit more accomplished. But <laughs> I don't know. At the end of the day. I see. I haven't done the PCT yet, so I I don't know if I'd prefer hiking in too much water or not enough water. I don't know. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to think. I I think I got wet from rain once. Are you wow? PCT hike. Okay, maybe this desert thing is sounding a little bit better after all then, because (laughs) that's pretty unreal. I'd say every on the AT, it must have been every three or four days at least. You know, I was hiking in rain for part of the day you know sometimes all day you know that was that was not fun but i've talked about the at enough on other episodes um just getting back to the desert uh just real quick here besides the umbrellas like what are like maybe this is just a really obvious question but what are some of the other ways that people would kind of deal with the sun and the heat would they just wear like the i don't even know what the name like the hats with the (laughs) big brims and like long sleeves and stuff like that is like what other ways are there to, to deal with the sun? So I, I wore a long sleeve shirt, the whole trail, same shirt. Actually it worked the whole time. So that nice. was good. <laughs> yeah. It was a Columbia Silver Ridge, I think. I'm not sure. At any rate. Yeah. So I, I had my sleeves down. I never rolled them up. Well, I, I won't say never, but rarely. Yeah. And uh, then I just wore a pair of shorts and then for a hat, I just used a ball cap. I didn't want a brimmed hat because, to me, they're more of a pain because I can't wear, like, my hoodie over the hat, a brimmed hat. So if it was cold in the morning, I had a wind jacket, and I'd put the hood over, up over my hat, or I have a, a fleece, and I'd put the hood up over my hat a lot. And I can't do that with a brimmed hat. So I didn't take a brimmed hat. But I did have a bandana. So I pretty much always had a bandana on under my hat. Okay, that Covering makes sense my neck and get the back inside of, neck, of yeah. my face. Yeah. I'm assuming people must bring sunscreen as well. Like, is that a stupid question? <laughs> <laughs> my daughter's dog. <laughs> So um, I brought sunscreen. I think most people do. I actually didn't use it except in the Sierra a couple times um, after I got sunburnt with a reflection of the sun off the yeah, snow. Yeah, off the snow. But I didn't. But I was pretty tan to start with from hiking in the desert and living in Phoenix. I didn't have trekking poles, so I didn't have to worry about my hands mm. getting sunburnt because... Hands get burnt really easy. So a lot of people wear sunglasses. 
Oh, sun gloves, really? Yeah. I've never heard of those in my life. That is They're kind of like <laughs> cycling gloves. Yeah. I can, I feel like I can kind of picture it now that you say it, but wow, I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> yeah, cuz your 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 hands will sunburn with the trekking poles cuz you're basically holding them out yeah. and saying, "Sun, here are my hands," yeah, you know. Pretty so much. Yeah, so sun gloves are used a lot. A lot of people do use brimmed hats. I I didn't but i i had the bandana on all the time Mm -hmm. i mean all the way to canada i had it on but sometimes it was just to keep the bugs away so (laughs) yeah true. because the bandana would be flopping around and and the mosquitoes would kind of keep them at (laughs) keep them at bay yeah i feel like i would have to wear sunscreen honestly because unlike you i do not live in a place that's sunny very often even during the summer so yeah, I, yeah, my skin would probably just melt after a couple of days. I yeah. don't know. I mean, the legs, they're covered with dirt, and uh, so <laughs> it's true. Kind of I guess you don't even sunscreen. need sunscreen. Yeah, you just rub dirt all over your body and your face. <laughs> the PCT is really dusty trail, especially through Southern California. So, man, this, these episodes always go by so fast. There's still so much I want to get to. Um Let's try to talk just real quick about the Sierras. So super, super famous section of the PCT. Anybody who's done any even light research on the PCT at all, like I have, have probably heard of the Sierras. And from my understanding, there are some additional pieces of equipment that you need to have. I know you mentioned, you know, some of the stuff that you picked up right before you went into the Sierra. Can you just kind of talk a little bit about, you know, what you picked up? And, you know, just kind of like how you used it, I guess. Yeah. So the first big thing is you need a bear canister um, going through Sequoia and Kings Canyon. That's required, yeah? Yeah, and Yosemite. I don't know if you could get away without having them. If you could make it to where there's campgrounds with bear boxes, which might be really difficult to do, (laughs) um, you might be able to get away with it. But basically, it's just easier. Um, yeah, and I think there's a 40 mile stretch, so you'd have to do like a 40 mile day in the mountains, and the ranger probably wouldn't believe you anyway. <laughs> um, so the bear can just for your food, and then I had micro spike shipped to me, um, so just some traction devices. Mm-hmm. Uh, so going over all these high passes, there's usually snow, so um, in the morning they'll be icy, and so they can be ha- uh, helpful there yeah a lot of people take ice axes i didn't feel it was needed when i went through i there wasn't a huge amount of snow this year and i got through i think i started in june 9th this is when i left kennedy meadows and headed into the sierra and there was some passes with snow but it wasn't real bad so i didn't bother getting an ice axe my whole plan was if I need one, I can buy one at Kennedy Meadows at, right. at the outfitter shop there. So that's – oh, and I had I had my trekking poles shipped to me there, which I wanted for river crossings, creek crossings, just for a little more stability there. Yeah, absolutely. Also, I use a tarp, so they just make it a little more convenient to put the tarp up if I need to put the tarp up. Yeah, and then I had, had a, basically a bug net thing set that I could put under my tarp. So kind of like a bivy, but it's, it's a little bigger than a bivy. And so kind of makes it a little net house inside my, under my tarp. Mm-hmm. So I had that scent. And I also had the snow baskets for my, um, trekking pole scent. Oh man. I, <laughs> I have a lot of, a lot of other questions about this, but we're kind of getting short on time. So I do kind of want to move on. Um, for those of you listening, if you have more questions about the Sierra or any of the stuff we've talked about today, definitely let me know because there will be more PCT guests on in the future. But one of the last subjects I wanted to talk about, Russell, was the fact that you did a vlog for your entire hike. Now, I have kind of played around with making videos on different hikes I've done before, but I never even for a minute really considered vlogging my AT through hike reason being is because I knew from just other backpacking uh, trips that I'd been on that 
that would just be one more thing to deal with at the end of the day, right? And I just felt like I wouldn't have the energy or the drive to, you know, in addition to all the difficulties that come with a long distance hike, I felt like I just wouldn't want to have like one more responsibility and difficulty, I guess. So what did you expect as far as the difficulty of keeping up a vlog like that before you set out? And how did those expectations kind of uh, pan out with what it was actually like when you were doing your vlog on the trail? So, yeah, I wanted to give it a shot. So when I went into this, I wasn't sure if I'd keep it up or not. I was kind of going to be a, a wait and see. Kind of feel it out. went kind of a thing. Right. And it actually went pretty well. I I would basically do it every day. I think if I tried to do a weekly one instead of a daily one, I would have never done it. To me, doing a day at a time was actually easy and a pleasure. I, I love looking back at the video sometimes now. It's like, yeah. oh, what happened when I was here? And I can go back and look at the, the video. And, and so that's really nice. And I know my family and friends enjoyed following along yeah definitely when i was on my hike so that was good it actually wasn't that bad i mean basically on a daily basis i just take video whenever and some things i'd take for the vlog but and i'd usually do a recap like what i'm doing today and a recap at the end of the day mm -hmm. and stuff like that but basically when i get to camp i copy the files from my camera so I, I shot on a real camera not my phone what camera did you use i had a sony rx100 i'm i should you know i'm literally about to buy that exact same camera i guess was it which uh which one like two or three or I had the mark five five okay yeah i'm gonna buy the yeah. three i can't afford the five right now but <laughs> so basically when i was setting up camp usually i just start transferring i basically got a little dongle i put on my phone and i'd take the sd card out and copy the files over mm -hmm. and then i'd get done with camp stuff and eating and then i just uh basically pull every video shot that i did during the day in into the video and then i just clip them and I rarely change the order or anything, and I'd set transitions in between. So after a while, it got to where it wouldn't take too long. Yeah. And my son supplied me all the music, so I just usually put some music in there with it. I wish I had more music than I had, but um, it, I decided to use only his music. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So it was just, to me, a really nice way to end the day because I could see what happened that day. It's so easy to go, what happened today? And then yeah. I see the videos and go, oh, yeah. That's true. And then it's like, well, I have this view. I saw these this mountain range across the way, you know, for hours. But look at how the view switched. That's one thing about hiking that I really love is is – as your day progresses, how a landmark comes into view and then fades away and stuff, you know. So Yeah, absolutely. So, at any rate, because of those reasons, I, I really enjoyed doing it. And the only difficult part was basically going into town. I would basically need to upload and yeah. schedule the videos. I didn't just blast them all out. I, I, I'd schedule them so only one would come out a day. And I think I stayed basically within a week behind the whole time. Mm -hmm. well, that's pretty so, good, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. It worked out really well. Like I say, if I had to do a week, it would have been really hard because then I'd have to figure out what to include and what not yeah. to include. And it just... See, that's that's a good point, actually. I never really thought about that, honestly, because if you just do the day, you don't really have as much to choose from. You know, you just have what you shot that particular right. day. So no, right. that makes so sense. I didn't... I didn't theme things too much and stuff, and my production quality is not, you know, it's my journal, really. Yeah. And uh, I had a great time doing it, and it's really good to jog the memories. I got a little emotional on some of them and <laughs> stuff, so people can see that. And uh, it was a really good thing that I'm glad I did. I, I think it was the right choice. No, that's awesome. Moving on to the last thing we're going to we're going to talk about today Russell my favorite part of the show 
It's called Trail Tales for a reason. We're going to talk about some stories from your through hike. So I'm going to open it up to just any story at all related to your hike, whether it's on the trail, in town, hitchhiking, weather, snakes, bears, desert stuff. I don't even know. Just any interesting story at all that you want to get out there and share with my small little audience here. So I got two stories. And the first one is a animal story. And it's actually for my Colorado Trail hike, cool. not the PCT. That works too. So it was a day I left Twin Lake. No, not Twin Lakes. Lake City. And we got into the San Juans. And uh, I hiked out of, of there with uh, another guy that I met at a hostel. At any rate, we got to where we were going to spend the night. And we were set, set up camp. And I got him in bed for the night. And um, I got to get up a couple times in the night. That's just an age thing, I guess. But So I, I go to put my shoe on to get up because it's kind of wet out. And uh, I put my foot in my shoe and, and it there's something in my shoe so i pull my oh, foot out geez. and i'm thinking i'm thinking the insole got mucked up so then i stick my hand in to straighten the insole out and uh and there's something furry in there oh <laughs> so i i kind of drop my shoe and and pull back and uh it's it was all in the dark i didn't have my headlamp yeah. on or anything and um but i think a pika was in my shoe so pika's <laughs> I, I don't know if you know what a pike is, but they're small, they're, they squeak, they kind of do this, Pikachu, you know. How do you, how do you spell it? I'm going to Google it. P-I-K-A, I'm pretty sure. Pika. So oh, they're okay. a little, yeah. little rodent, and they make these high-pitched squeaks, and they're all <laughs> over in the mountains in Colorado, and, and they're, they are in the PC too, especially, especially northern in Washington. Um, they like alpine areas. Gotcha. So, yeah, so a pika was in my shoe. So that was pretty funny. <laughs> They're kind of cute, honestly, just looking at the they picture. They are. They are. <laughs> I thought you were going to say like a snake or a scorpion or some creepy thing, but I guess. No, but it was <laughs> I was like half asleep, <laughs> so I'm thinking, oh, my socks messed up. Oh, my insoles messed up. and. I never even thought something would be in my shoe. So <laughs> that's a good one. That's one of the hazards of sleeping under a tarp, I guess. Is yeah, no kidding. An animal go inside your shoe. And the other story is um, this was on the PCT. So you go to Truckee. So you go to Donner Pass, which is kind of infamous. Um, the Donner Party, you know, that's where they oh, had their problems. Um, no kidding. That is yeah. on the PCT, really? Or well, yeah, the PCT, like, yeah. oh, that's cool. I actually didn't know that. Yeah, so there's the ski area there, and it's called the Donner Ski Ranch. And you can show your permit there, and they'll give you a beer, too. So that's Ooh, a good nice. place to stop. Yeah, it's noted. not too far off the trail. But at any rate, I hitched um, down to Truckee to get a new pair of shoes and to resupply. And uh, I got this ride by uh, this couple and the gal got in the back seat and she was just totally sloshed. I mean, mm. she, I don't know if she could stand up. She was so drunk. And uh, so she asked me what I was doing. And I said, I'm hiking the Pacific Crest Trail and stuff. And she's asked, when I started and how far I'd gone and how, and I was basically, I'm going, I started in Mexico and I'm going to Canada. And, uh, so she didn't really know anything about hiking and she's like, I, it was just funny. She's like, well, why? <laughs> and, and not, not, not why as in why would you do that? But like, what's your story? What are you escaping from? What are you <laughs> running from? Kind of a thing. <laughs> And and she's going on and on and the don't and then she's handing me bottles of vodka and something else and make me have drinks and stuff and it was just really hard to say no to her. <laughs> but she she's like, What's your story? There's gotta be a reason. What are you running from? You know, it's like I'm not running from anything. Where's your warrant? Yeah, it's like 
is she relationship bad at home? And I go, no, I really love my wife. You know, yeah. <laughs> Some people I got a great family. Like the hike. <laughs> it was, it was just so funny. And she just grabbed my beard and says, I want the truth. What's the story? And stuff. <laughs> It was just a really, really strange hitch. At least, uh, at least she wasn't driving in that condition. Like, yeah, I... I've had some other guests tell stories about with drunk drivers, and that's that's no good. We do not condone that yeah. on Trail Tales. <laughs> the guy wasn't uh, completely sober, but he was. He seemed fine. So. <laughs> Sober enough to know that she might have been freaking out a little bit. It was it was the Fourth of July, so they were celebrating. So I guess it's gonna happen. Well, on that note, Russell, thank you so much for taking the time today. This was awesome. I definitely learned a lot about the PCT. I learned what a pica is, and I'm going to learn even more about the camera I'm about to buy in just a minute. So yeah, no, this was really cool, and uh, yeah, just thank you so much for taking the time. Before we go, I kind of want to ask, first of all, where can people find your vlogs on YouTube and uh, where can people go to follow you on other forms of social media that you like to share? My YouTube channel is Russell in the Bush. So if you just go to YouTube and search for Russell in the Bush and or just Russell and PCT, I'll probably pop up for, I, I post on Instagram too and uh that is R. Korfman, so R C O R F like Frank M A N. That's my uh, Instagram account, and uh, I've kind of been on hiatus since I got back. So um, makes sense. Yeah, I, I need to get get going on that. Well, again, people so. can still go and check out some of the things that you posted while you were still on the trail. So that's awesome. Yeah. I will put a link to both of those. Uh, places in the description of the episode in the show notes so my last question before we kind of wrap this up here russell i gotta ask what is next for you as far as hiking is concerned yeah i've been thinking about that and trying to figure that out i don't know if i want to do another long trail just because it's so disruptive yeah to everything else mm-hmm I mean, I I love being on I love being on the trail, and it was just fabulous. And uh, and I know I love being on the trail again. So if I did do a long trail, it would probably be the CDT. Um, though I was looking at the AT um, this year, but that just looks too wet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so shorter hikes. Um, there's some routes that this guy, blister free. His name's Brett Tucker, I think, put together. So he put together a trail called the Grand Enchantment Trail. Basically goes from Phoenix to Albuquerque. And I think it's about 750 miles. So thinking of that, uh, that's a possibility. He has another route in New Mexico, I think, called the Northern New Mexico Loop, maybe. And it's about 500 miles. He also did the Low to High route, which goes from Death Valley um, up to top of Whitney. So that'd be cool. Mm. But yeah, probably shorter stuff like that. And I wouldn't mind doing the Pacific Northwest trail. Oh yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's another trail. I really don't know very much about, so I'd like to have a guest on that's done that trail at some point. So if you listening to this, know anybody who has done the Pacific Northwest trail and they want to be on a stupid little podcast, let me know. Cause I love to talk to them. All right. I guess uh, I guess we're going to wrap it up, Russell. Thank you so much for taking the time. Don't hang up quite yet. But um, yeah, uh, for everybody listening, thank you very much. Enjoy your drive or your lawn mowing or your laundry folding. Or where, what what do you usually do when you're listening to podcasts? Hiking. There's, there's a pretty obvious one. You're hiking. What do you usually do when you're listening to podcasts, Russell? I'm usually driving somewhere to go hike or something like that. So <laughs> I can't do more than like one thing at a time. So <laughs> awesome. Yeah, this is great. I enjoyed this a lot. So thank you. Yeah, no problem. Hey, thank you very, very much to everybody listening. And yeah, that's it. Yeah.